Welcome to Conversation with a Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College. And today we have Jesse Clark, Assistant Professor of Geography at the University of Nevada, Reno. Jesse, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me, Mike. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. As, as we discuss in many other uh, interviews of this oral history series, we'd like to know a little bit about um, what captivated your interest in your geography? Would you care to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so many different things, actually. Um, I certainly never set out to be a geographer, although I think I'm one of the few um, geographers that studied, got their degrees in, with their, in their bachelor's, their master's, and their PhD. So a geographer through and through, at least institutionally. Um, but, um, so yeah, I never kind of imagined that I would go in, down the route of geography, but uh, there are a number of experiences when I was growing up, I think, that helped shape those interests. Um, one was I did a lot of travel with my father. He was a geologist, and we did a lot of, um, I joined him on a lot of field trips to different rural areas in the United States, primarily. So, you know, we were, he was in the industry, so we were going to some of these, you know, very small mining communities. So I became interested in kind of these boom and bust cycles and these communities, how they were, how they grew up, and then how they very quickly, it seemed to, um, kind of dissipated. Mostly and in the American West. Mostly in the American West, yeah. So um, because of his job, we, I grew up all over the West. So when people mm -hmm. ask where I'm from, it's a, it's a hard question. I often say I'm from the West because mm -hmm. I was born in Colorado. We moved to Utah, back to Colorado, Idaho, Arizona, ended up going to Oregon, and then of course now I'm in Nevada. So I became very familiar with the American Western landscape and how it was changing, and especially in rural areas. And I liked to think, when we would visit these communities, I always, I, it sparked questions about not only kind of the nature of these places, right, what they looked like, what the what the people who lived there looked like, but also um, what were some of the processes elsewhere that led to the growth of these communities um, and, and um, also the end of some of these communities too as the industry is constantly changing. And so it was kind of, it was, those, it was, yeah, it was that experience with my father I think that really kind of sparked an interest in geography. And so, so as a child and, of the West, and, and yeah. now you're in a department that really has a strong focus on the American West. Yeah, it's have, ironic, have, yeah. Do, do you have any inclination to perhaps revisit some of those places that you had first visited with your dad? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was really interesting. I remember going to interview for this position at University of Nevada, Reno, and I immediately felt this kinship with the landscape there because I'd spent time there. And I, in particular, I spent one summer um, along Highway 50 and doing, I was working with some geologists out of the University of Arizona at the time, actually doing some soil sampling. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we just, yeah, we spent about two months working along Highway 50, and it was the best summer of my life. It <laughs> really was. And if you, yeah, if you haven't been along Highway 50, it's amazing. It's incredible. Loneliest highway in America, they oh. call it. Um, and, and yeah, I do. I, I hope um, sometime soon and maybe sooner than later, I can start doing some work in some of the communities in Nevada. And I'm particularly interested in thinking about some of the social implications of um, these changing economies and these um, kind of the growth and decline of these different mining communities and the implications on um, family relationships and um, social and community relationships. And so some of the same questions I've been asking in my work in Turkey, maybe bringing those to some of to some research in Nevada. Well, well it sounds fascinating. Yeah. And there's certainly certainly a need for that kind of work, especially especially for um, one who is a devoted geographer, characterized yeah. by conducting sound field work, really, yeah. which yeah. is which is great. Let's talk about your um, academic background in yeah. geography. Who who influenced you academically? Let's say starting off. Yeah. At, in your undergraduate year. So many people. Um, I don't know if we have enough time for this, but um, so many people. So right off, right from the beginning, I, I was in Arizona at the time. Mm -hmm. I went to high school in Arizona, and I really wanted to leave. Um, I really wanted to go out of state. We didn't have the money to do that at the time, so I was applying for a lot of scholarships, and 
I really had my heart set on going to the University of Oregon. Um, I was an avid track fan. My parents had been there in the 70s. I had this very romantic Go image free. of Eugene. Yes. And so even though I'd never been there. And so I applied to the University of Oregon and I applied through this scholarship called the Western Undergraduate Exchange Program. And I think they still have it actually. Um, and so you, so um, you could choose from a list of participating members, uh, participating universities, and if you were accepted under this program, you could go to a school, um, an out-of-state school, for one and a half times the in-state tuition. So it was a really great way to um, afford an out-of-state education. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I qualified for this program, and then they, but they asked the caveat was that you had to choose from a list of majors, so define a major before coming in. And I kind of was, you know, working through this list, and um, I came across geography, and I thought, you know, of course, immediately I think maps. Oh, I, oh and I love maps, ob you know, obviously. But um, and so then I did a little research and came across some website that said, how do you know you want to be a geographer? And it was things like you have to have the window seat of the airplane, or you flip to the back of the airline magazine to look at the maps. And so I thought maybe this is for me, and I applied. Um, and declared geography, and then I got a handwritten letter from Alec Murphy in the geography program at Oregon, encouraging me to come and, you know, for a senior in high school to get a handwritten letter from a professor um, was a really Great incredible. Guy. Yeah, and he's and he really served as a mentor for me when I got to mm -hmm. um, Oregon, and I took his political geography class, and it was that one class that just changed how I thought about the world. And I hope I tell my students, I said, I hope you all have that class. And um, hopefully it's my class, but I hope you all have that class that just completely shifts your perceptions um, and challenges you to think about things in a very different way. And his class did that for me and got me really interested in all things political, politically geographic. So, you know, borders and territories and political identities. And so um, that was kind of the launching off point for a lot of my research interests. Well, it, it made Turkey really a fertile ground for research for you, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell us how, how you got there the first time. Um, so, yeah, I did a study abroad trip when I was at, um, at Oregon. And that <coughs> was a really significant trip. And I um, was in Ankara for a program there. And then at the end of the trip, I decided to take a train train trip to southeast Turkey, mm -hmm. the Kurdish areas, for um, just a short for a couple days and got on a train and went down there and was just really interested in some things that were going on in that region. Um, in particular, it had just come out of a sustained period of conflict mm -hmm. between um, a Kurdish armed nationalist group, the PKK, and the Turkish state. So you could really kind of feel that in the air. Um, but at the same time, there was a, a big kind of multifaceted development project mm -hmm. that was being initiated called The Gap. Right. And I was really interested in how development was being used as a kind of tool by the state to, for, um, um, to address security concerns in the region and I guess more broadly to kind of socially and economically incorporate Kurdish populations into Turkish society. And so I became kind of very interested in this relationship between development and nation building and security and decided to do my master's research on some of these issues and then follow that up with my PhD research. So you uh, pursued your, your, your graduate work initially at uh, Arizona mm -hmm. and you worked with? Sally Marston, yeah, who was great. Another great mentor for me. Mm -hmm. um, who just really challenged me in, in many ways, um, particularly in terms of methods. So challenging me to think about um, being very thoughtful in the way I was approaching research and asking the right questions. And she really helped guide that research, absolutely. So all the way from the master's to the PhD. And you really, you really had a great opportunity to essentially engage in the crafting of a master's thesis and a doctoral dissertation in the same area. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have done it any different. I, I felt like I just got a little taste for the master's. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I was told, and I tell students this now too, you know, the master's is really, it's an exercise in research, you know, and so, and that's what it was. It was an exercise in going to a new place, um, just becoming accustomed to a, the culture, 
um, you know, talking with people there and just learning something and then being able to produce, you know, a thesis out of that. And, um, and then that led to some follow-up questions and that's, and I did some more in-depth work, real in-depth work in my dissertation. So um, I, and I was able to spend a significant amount of time in the region and I think I needed that just to understand mm -hmm. what was going on. And Well, and you went several times. I did, yeah. And I've, to, to, I mean, to this day, I go back almost every year. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent about, I spent a year for my master's in Turkey, but only three months was in Southeast Turkey. And then I spent about a year in Southeast Turkey for my dissertation. So a uh, significant amount of time. And then, like I said, I go back for about a month every summer. You know, it, it, it's interesting because you have um, conducted your research in an area that it doesn't seem like many geographers have sought to pursue. It's it's sort of an awkward area, yeah. and and not not only regionally, mm -hmm. but in terms of the topic, gender and yeah. security yeah. in this part of the world that is characterized by conflict and yeah. and very difficult to develop relationships with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, I don't know what it was about, Diyarbakir in particular is where I worked, and I don't know what it was about Diyarbakir that drew me there in 2003, um, but I do feel like it was faded. Um, I ended up meeting quite, I met my best friend there and her family and just amazing, incredible people, and I've built relationships that have fueled me to continue to work there, and I, to me, Southeast Turkey is home for sure, and mm -hmm. so that's... Um, yeah, so that's it's gotten into your blood. It has. It certainly, it certainly has. Yeah, but you're right. Um, it wasn't a, a part of the world that a lot of geographers, I guess probably even researchers in general, were spending a good amount of time doing long, sustained ethnographic work. And um, I think it's it's hard. It's difficult. You know, it's difficult to do work on um, and. Uh, a nation within a nation, I guess I could say that. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of security concerns. There were a lot of security concerns to consider working on Kurdish issues in Turkey, um, where the climate has not always been very favorable for that kind of work. So that's, um, um, has I've forced me to kind of definitely ask a lot of really important ethical questions in my research, but, um, but I think it's important. I think these are really important places to study and go to so that you can challenge some of the images that we see out of these regions, you know. Um, and for example, in Turkey, um, sometimes in official discourse at least, um, the Kurdish regions are, you know, affiliated with terrorism and violence and um, just really negative images, but it's, they're really lovely places and so um, I, it's, it was nice to kind of get to know this region on a really human level. Well, the territory is sort of at a juncture of, of these different political boundaries, yeah. different ethnic boundaries yeah. to some degree, yeah. and then also the physical environment is much different than yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. And you have the development going on, which has um, a marked impact on neighboring countries, especially yeah. with regard to hydropower. Right, and, absolutely. And um, yeah, you you allude to the notion that the Turkish government uses this perhaps as an excuse to attempt to assimilate the Kurdish population into the mainstream of Turkish society. Development. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, I there's certainly a nation building component mm -hmm. involved. Interestingly enough, though, my research also involved looking at local pro Kurdish development <coughs> initiatives. So development programs sponsored by the pro Kurdish party um, that's been in municipal offices since 1999 that has a clear agenda of fighting for rights and recognition in Turkey. And so I worked both in Turkish sponsored programs focused on women's education and empowerment programs. So I was primarily located in the cities. And so I worked in both Turkish sponsored centers and pro-Kurdish sponsored centers. And um, while both had very similar goals in their development efforts, um, they were shaped by different national interests. Mm -hmm. And that was quite interesting to me. So it was a very, um, uh, you saw this clear kind of expression of a, 
of a sort of geopolitical identity um, in these programs in these very intimate ways in the ways that um, um, kind of women had become involved. So I, yeah, I found that really well, interesting. Let's, let's talk about the women for, for a moment. Yeah. Because again, this is, this is very important uh, research that you have conducted and it's, um, it's discussed in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. but the way in which you, you went about this is, is rather unique in terms of not only engaging in the ethnographic research, but in terms of, of discerning that it was so difficult for a person to be a woman in Turkey, let alone a Kurdish woman. Mm -hmm. Very difficult for yeah. a Kurdish woman to, to yeah. live. And um, yeah. indicating really that that enhancement of of educational opportunities was really key for for um, the development of the Kurdish people yeah. in, in, in this part of Turkey. Yeah, women have been so central to the motivations and goals of the Kurdish movement in Southeast Turkey, but across um, the Kurdish region. So in um, Sir Syria, Kurdistan as well, mm -hmm. um, in Iraq. And um, so women have been, are very kind of crucial to the project. And so in um, this, I mentioned to you this Kurdish armed nationalist movement called mm -hmm. the PKK that appeared in the 1980s and um, fought the state consistently for um, at times for independence, but at other times more for rights mm -hmm. and recognition. And at the core of the PKK's political philosophy has been a very um, sort of open and empowered um, and democratic kind of involvement of women in the political process. And, and so that was really interesting to see and see how crucial women have been to the motivations of um, the pro-Kurdish party in Southeast Turkey in particular. So, um, you know, I can remember... Uh, International Women's Day is celebrated mm -hmm. um, in in Diyarbakir uh, quite um, quite dramatically, and there were big. I remember there being big marches. I was there for I think three years um, at various times over the same um, in March, so I was able to see the celebrations and across um, a few years. And you know, you'd have this march of um, women who would be waving. You know, they'd be waving red, green, and yellow, and then um, up this, the colors of the Kurdish flag, but then also they'd be waving purple. So it was just a sea of red, yellow, green, and then purple, right? So the international feminist color of purple. And, um, and it, it was, so it's just, it was, that was such a visceral kind of image of how these two things were very integrated, kind of gendered empowerment and nation building, Kurdish nation building. And the Kurds have um, involved women in political office, um, that's a big goal that they have to have equal representation across genders in Turkey as well as in Syria. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Well, it's certainly a um, a part of the process of facilitating, I guess, sound development and stability in the region. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it'll work out. Well, we'll see. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the region's devolved into conflict, and um, since July, actually, a number of the neighborhoods I've worked in um, are now essentially war zones. So, so uh, yeah, I don't really, I, you know, I'm still thinking through what's going on and why, um, and I will talk about some of this tonight as well, but... Um, yeah, so I don't know. It seems like development's on hold for the time being. And as much as there were great strides made, I think, um, and a kind of genuine desire to see change and peace in that region through development, um, that seems to have been put on a standstill right now. Ha have you noticed if there are any significant Kurdish or Turkish leaders that have spoken on behalf of uh, facilitating women's empowerment and uh, the, and enhancing the role of women in in decision making. Um, well, certainly, any pro Kurdish political leader today talks about these issues quite a bit. Um, the major leader that emerged in the last prior to the last election um, out of this party is um, Selahattin Demirtas, mm -hmm. who is very charismatic um, and has spoken 
quite a lot about the importance of including women in the movement, um, but any number of um, some of the other um, women who are involved in this movement as well. I sell to Luke. Um, so, so yeah, I, definitely out of the pro-Kurdish um, side for sure. You see that a lot. And it's a little bit, the current um, National Turkish Administration, the AKP, has a very, has cultivated a very different kind of approach to women and the role of women in, in the Turkish nation and Turkish state. And um, his um, platform and party has been a little bit more Islamist leaning, a mm -hmm. um, little bit more conservative. And so um, he's implemented a series of policies and kind of made speeches in which, where he's encouraging, where, where some women would argue that he's actually ask, um, kind of um, suggesting women shouldn't be as empowered and should actually stay in the home and have babies and raise families. And um, so this is a point of contention right now in his administration. Now, now you've remarked in, in some of your writing that um, Kurdish women may seem to identify with oppressed peoples elsewhere, as in the U.S. Yeah, um, I think Kurds... Or disenfranchised peoples. Or yeah, something. I think Kurds more broadly um, have. So I would hear, you know, references to... Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. Malcolm X, and I think cur the Kurds have an affinity to the story of African American people here in the mm -hmm. United States. Um, similarly, they had, um, I often heard references to um, the Scots too, and their fight for independence. And so there are, you know, the, the Kurds have tapped into movements elsewhere mm -hmm. in which um, people are fighting for very similar things. The Basques as well. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting, the, um, um, the pro-Kurdish party has at various times met with leaders of um, the Basque administration to kind of talk about um, ideas moving forward to fight for more um, independence and kind of exchange ideas on how you um, uh, kind of create an empowered people in your, um, in your administration. And yeah, so it's, it's interesting. There are some, some ties there. Well, well, it is interesting, especially as it seems to be, I think, within the last decade especially, uh, more, more geographers that have looked at social justice and have conducted qualitative research in mm -hmm. reference to social justice issues yeah. in Mexico, in the U.S., elsewhere. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's a huge... Um, that's something that's very valued in a lot of this ethnographic work, um, and it's in particular some of the feminist geography that I've been inspired by. And um, so I, you know, I certainly, yeah, I don't look at research as just a tool to collect a bunch of data and describe a place. Um, I think you should absolutely be engaged with that place. Mm -hmm. And I think. In fact, the best way to do that, so there's this, I think there's this emphasis on gathering data and then doing something with that. And I'm still trying to figure out what I do with that in a place that is so politically sensitive, where my contributions are, in all honesty, I think, very limited, you know? Um, but, and I've had to think about what are my contributions? What, what can I do through this work in a place that I really, really care about, people I really, really care for? And I've thought about um, the role of just the research process as being kind of a form of social justice itself, where, you know, and just in building relationships with people, you know, meeting people who have maybe some shared experiences with you, maybe some different experiences, but, but just talking with people and hearing their stories, I think is, um, is really special and important and transformative. And building collaborative research relationships um, internationally or in the places that you're working is really important and that's something that I've tried to do um, and it's a way to bring that voice um, into back here and into the folds of ac academic work here and I think that's so important and something that I strive to do. That is very important Yeah. and it's a um different angle, I guess, a different approach than simply going into an area, 
reporting on it, making others aware, and leaving it at that. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. apparently have decided to do something you don't know what yet, mm -hmm. and maybe that what will come in the future. Um, you, you've also discussed the matter in which you engage in research, yeah. and you've recently commented on um, field methods mm -hmm. and the problems associated with conducting field work, particularly as they might be administered by certain statutes or standards by various review boards mm -hmm. and how problematic that can be while one engages in conducting field work. You know, I'm Dr. Clark. And okay, I have a problem with my back, for example, yeah. is, a, is an issue, right? Yeah, yeah. Would you care to elaborate on that? Yeah. No, I remember <laughs> one of the first times I was in the neighborhoods where I did research and I went to um, a seminar, it was a health seminar at one of the centers I was working at. And, and I was introduced by one of the administrators as a doctor, or I was working on my doctorate. Um, and one of the women interpreted that as I'm a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And so she came over to ask me if, to tell me about her aching back and mm -hmm. ask me what I could do for her. And I felt, I felt so helpless and, and very sheepish about the fact that I, I couldn't help her and that, in fa and that I was there to, I don't know, it was where I came up with mm, the challenges of doing research, research that you have High expectations will kind of help change and transform people's lives, but it doesn't. It may not do that in the immediate and in in the in a way that is right away useful to people you're working with, and and that's hard. That's hard. I don't have an answer for what for that kind of ethical dilemma. I don't, and and so I've been trying. You know what I do is I try to address it through, again you know, just a commitment to that place. I keep going back, I keep working with people there. I bring, you know, my Kurdish research collaborator and dear friend to, to the United States and we work together and we are having constant conversations and I just hope that out of that can come some really good work and um, we can make visible some of the challenges in this region in a really positive way. And, and we'll see, you know. Well, well, that's it's great that you have such a high level of dedication to the region, and yeah. and so so much solid field work, so much solid geographical yeah. work yeah. rests upon developing relationships. Yeah, and it is it is Absolutely. something that um, will certainly continue to bear fruit. Yeah, in in, in the future. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 talk about some of your future efforts perhaps. Do you have any any goals for the future in terms of your research, your teaching? Yeah, um and teaching. Yeah, so I yeah, a lot. Um well, there are there are some question marks at the moment because uh I up until well, July, um I had plans to begin a new project in Southeast Turkey with my research collaborator there, um, looking at youth mm -hmm. and how youth in the neighborhoods we were working in, these poor um, migrant neighborhoods um, of displaced families from the conflict in the 90s, how youth are forming relationships with the city and kind of finding a sense of community in the city. And um, especially as a lot of money has been pumped into the construction industry in Diyarbakir, but cities mm -hmm. around Turkey and you've seen um, particularly pumped into luxury apartment complexes and shopping malls and brand new mosques. And so you've seen over the last 10 years, you know, I've worked in this region, you've seen this in the urban structure, this huge kind of socioeconomic gap um, where these neighborhoods have become more and more marginalized that I was working in. And um, at the detriment to these young people growing up in these very ghettoized spaces, um, not being able to kind of feel like they belong to the city. So we were noticing some, uh, some of these challenges and we, um, I was in Turkey this last summer to uh, do a little bit of reconnaissance work for this project. 
Um, unfortunately, those same neighborhoods, as I said before, are now conflict zones, and a lot of those youth have actually taken up arms with the PKK to fight the Turkish state. So I feel like we're a little bit late in getting to this, but um, it's still an interesting question. And I think that we may, we've been talking about doing some work in northern Iraq and um, mm -hmm. Iraqi Kurdistan, where, and maybe do some similar work with women, but maybe focus on youth. Um, that's another region that's going through quite a transformation now. Seemingly a safer region today. A safer region. I would say it's one of the safer regions in the Middle mm -hmm. East right now. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they've been, at least thus far, have been able to kind of defend themselves against ISIS pretty well, have been a um, formidable force, I would say, alongside the Syrian Kurds. So it is quite um, a safe place. It's a, it's a place that's had a lot of foreign investment uh, recently, particularly from Turkey. It's kind of ironic. Um, and so, so the soci society's changing a lot, and I think it would be interesting to, to go there and understand some of the cultural and social changes going on, particularly talking to, we'd like to talk to young women and maybe mm -hmm. do some work at a university there. Um, about kind of their perceived changes of what's going on in the country and their sense of, of opportunity for themselves as women. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. We're, I'm, we're in the middle of that right now. Well, you're one of the few people that can do this, really. I mean, not only just in geography, but, but in the United States, you have the, um, the ability not only to to develop the relationships, but you already have relationships with yeah. Kurdish people. Yeah. You have some command of the language, yeah. and uh, you know what's going on. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Let's and let's let's talk about um, your role as a geographer. Yeah. In academe. Yeah. Um, you're a geographer. Yeah. How do you <laughs> feel about that? I love it. I love it. I want everybody to be a geographer. I think I think most people have an inner geographer somewhere hidden, and it's just our job to pull it out. So that's, that's what my, my daughter said. That's my mission. So that's my mission in teaching. <laughs> to pull out everybody's inner geographer, yeah. huh? Yeah. Why not? You know, I think what it is is it's a I think it's cultivating a sense of curiosity about the world and about places. And um, that's what I'm that's what I try to do, you know, in teaching and 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 I think it's, and that's something that I think geographers do really well is bring a curiosity to places and people and processes. And, and, I, and I, I want my students to do the same, so. I'd like to think that we ask the right questions. Yeah, we're good at asking questions, I think. I think. And we struggle with answering them as well. <laughs> I think that's true too. I think that's very true. But you know, I really say I go into the classroom and I, I've more and more now, my only expectation out of the classroom is that students leave with at least one question, one, one question they want to answer and pursue. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, our education system now is so focused on um, memorization and regurgitation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as, as teachers, you know, K through 12 and university, and we, yeah, it's, I think that's our responsibility is to help kind of pull out that critical thinking, that creative mind, that curious mind, you know? And so geographers, I think. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, are the people Absolutely. that do it. <laughs> well, given that, do you have any recommendations for aspiring geographers? Undergraduate, um, young graduate students? Recommendations for aspiring geographers. Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I hope that they've, you know, uh, for aspiring geographers. I think, you know, I, go, I guess I go back to curiosity and I would say, ask questions. Mm -hmm. That's what I would suggest. Ask questions and find people who can help shape those questions and help you answer them. You know, um, I, you asked me at the very beginning who my mentors were, and I, and I have a long list of mentors, and I would not be here without those people. And they have um, helped me hone my kind of curiosity and answer some questions that um, I'd had. And, and I think that that's, it's important to um, have those people, for sure. 
Jesse, thank you so much for joining us thank today. Thank you, Mike. It's, it's been a pleasure. This concludes our session of conversation with a geographer for today. Thank you very much.